Good evening. I suppose it's back to the future tonight. Match of the day returning on a regular basis after a gap of four seasons and 28 years after the very first programme. I don't remember it. Each week we'll have two main matches from the new Premier League plus highlights from all the others played on Saturday. We'll be doing our best to be sharp up front and tight at the back. Gary and Alan, like the rest of us, looking forward to a new season with a new league. There are new rules. Pass back at your peril. The referees are the new kits on the block. There are new signings galore. Old faces. And we hope bags of the old excitement. Good cross, Chapman, good save. Chapman, off the line. McAllister, McAllister, wide. It's going off the post. Goodness me. On this first programme, we feature last season's league champions, Leeds, and the team that looked destined for the title for so long, Manchester United. Well, we started Ellen Road, Leeds United against Wimbledon, who were starting their seventh season amongst the elite. And starting his 22nd season at the microphone for us was John Motson. A big reception for Leeds United, the last champions of the old football league, running out to launch the new Premier League and given a stirring reception on a ground where these supporters never saw them lose in the league last season. The only club indeed in the four divisions to be undefeated at home. Dean Holdsworth, who scored 38 goals for Brentford last season, makes his Wimbledon debut after becoming their record buy in a deal valued at £1 million. While Leeds number nine, Lee Chapman, a proven goal scorer at top level, has scored five times in his last four matches against Wimbledon. Leeds field the team that played in the charity shield, which means that three international midfield players can't get into the side. Indeed, £2 million record signing David Rowcastle isn't even on the bench. The substitutes are Steve Hodge, club captain Gordon Strachan and reserve goalkeeper Mervyn Day. Clubs can name a goalkeeper as a third substitute this season, but only two subs can be used during the game. A blow for Wimbledon is the absence of John Fashionu, who is almost a presidential figure at the club these days. He's out with a hamstring injury, so number seven, Paul Miller, partners Holdsworth up front. At number three, Gary Elkins plays left back because Terry Phelan has been unsettled by some turbulent transfer talk involving Manchester City. On the far side, the first block of Leeds' new East Stand, a £5.6 million project which is due to be completed with 17,000 seats for the start of next season. And a new strip for referee and linesman this season in the Premier League. They're wearing green tops. That's Gerald Ashby from Worcester in the middle and his two linesmen, Wally Natras of Ferry Hill on the left and on the right, Terry Lynch of Middlesbrough. Just making some notes down there on the Wimbledon bench. Third from left, manager Joe Kinnear. Turned things around for them last season. So after all the hype and the build-up, the Premier League is underway. Leeds United all in white. The champions playing from the left. Wimbledon in blue. There's Rod Wallace. To Rigo. So the first free kick to be taken by Scott Fitzgerald, number six for Wimbledon. There goes Earl, number eight, pursued by Batty. And by Wallace. Free kick. David Batty, who played in Graham Taylor's team in the European Championships in Sweden. But lots of competition now for midfield places here at Leeds. My goodness, there is. And it's failed the offside trap there. McAllister beat it, but John Scales is so fast, he made up the ground. Speed just making his way in there. It's aimed at Chapman first. Clark, Holdsworth. 
Newsom with the challenge. And then it was Batty. Oh, he can't pass back to his goalkeeper. There's an incident with Scott Fitzgerald. He had to hurriedly turn the other way. Last season, he would just have nudged that back to Hans Seggers. <laughs> Not this time. Otherwise, it would have had Seggers picked the ball up uh, from the back pass, it would have been an indirect free kick. And the new law applies whether the back pass or whether the pass comes from inside or outside the penalty area. There's Chapman, there's Wallace. Chapman again. He's got a terrific strike rate throughout his career, Lee Chapman, one of those who can look to a goal every two games or so. And uh, this was an instant effort. The throw aimed at him in the first place, the flick on, and when Barton returned it, Chapman volleyed it. Sanchez. Headers by Chapman and then Speed. Cantona's pass to McAllister opens things up for Leeds. There are three the other way for him. That was Newsom. McAllister's cross. Wallace is there. It might run on. Oh, and Joseph in trouble. Chapman. <laughs> Lee Chapman scoring. A goal which will please the supporters and himself, but it won't please Wimbledon the way it came about. But last season's top scorer gets the first goal in the Premier League for the defending champions. And it all came from a cross by Gary McAllister. But Roger Joseph here, now was he in two minds about passing back to the goalkeeper? I think he may have been. Chapman certainly robbed him and steered it wide of Seggers. Leeds take the lead after 15 minutes. Elkins. Onside, Cantona, Chapman's in the middle, Speed is joining him now. Good cross, Chapman, good save, Chapman, off the line. McAllister, McAllister, wide. Exciting stuff. Hans Seggers responding well to the first header by Lee Chapman. But what a great cross as Chapman acknowledged by Cantona in the first place. That was superbly delivered by the Frenchman. Just look at the accuracy here and pace. There's the header. Instant stop by the goalkeeper. Here's Chapman again. Off the post, was it? Or, the, or Seggers again. And then McAllister and then Fitzgerald. And finally wide by McAllister. But uh, I think it hit the post in the middle there too. Here comes Batty. Cantona up with Seggers. Sustained attacking play by Leeds. When they build up a head of steam, as we saw last season, they can be relentless. As indeed the Leeds of old used to be. Can't pass it back. I know I keep saying it, but already in this half, of uh, the first half of Premier League football, we've seen defenders like Scott Fitzgerald caught in two minds, and Roger Joseph will sympathise with him there because it was really his indecision that led to the goal. Chapman. This time Cantona finds McAllister. And Wimbledon very much on the receiving end here. Dorigo. Speed makes the run now, and a good one it is too. Chapman! Well, he'll be picking himself up rather gingerly because uh, I remember Lee Chapman getting a very bad injury when he uh, showed typical bravery on one occasion last season. This is Gary Speed uh, looking for Chapman at the far post. It was a good cross again. He got it well, cleared the crossbar with the header, but I think it was against Manchester United where Chapman damaged himself last season. He seems to be all right today. And Gary Speed supplying the ammunition for him.
Clark. It was uh, Paul Miller who was fouled. So it's a free kick to Wimbledon. Earl is in there, so was Sanchez. Header out by Speed, then Elkins, Sanchez. This is Miller. Touch on for Holdsworth. This is Scales. That looked mighty close from here. John Scales, who'd stayed forward after the free kick with Wimbledon's best effort of the half so far. It's Paul Miller who sets the play up. And when the ball comes out to Scales, well, it certainly shaved the post. Change there and face to face Sanchez and McAllister. That looked as though it might get nasty for a moment. I don't know whether Gerald Ashby has managed to catch up with that. He had to follow the play. Um, there was a moment of uh, some temper there between the two number tens. In fact, uh, it's called a bit now because uh, McAllister's gone across to take the corner. And. Uh, and Chapman take up their near post positions. Speed coming in. One of his qualities is good heading ability, Gary Speed, and that came right on half time with his team leading by one goal to nil, maintaining the good form they always seem to show against Wimbledon. Lee Chapman. Indeed, has now scored six goals against the Dons in uh, the last five meetings, and it was his goal which put Leeds in front. This could have been two, right on half-time, a header by Gary Speed. And Steve Hodge is on for the second half for Leeds in place of David Batty, who has an Achilles injury. The new Premier League has given uh, spectators and uh, commentators a bit more time to drink our coffee and eat our chocolate at half-time because it's now a 15-minute break rather than 10. But uh, here are Leeds, keen to get back into action. That's a foul by Cantona on Barton. And the referee needs to speak to the Frenchman, and indeed, he's going to be booked. This is the incident. Barton goes for the ball. Cantona definitely caught Barton's leg and didn't meet the ball. So a high challenge gets a caution. Gerald Clark on the far side McAllister's header out that was Miller again and here's Earl and there was a foot up there that's going to be an indirect free kick for dangerous play somebody raised their foot Leeds are protesting but I have a feeling that Mr Ashby is quite right whether they'll say he was lifting his foot to play the ball is another matter but uh, just see what you think here it's knocked in I think by Laurie Sanchez there's Andy Clark now, is that foot up? Clearly, in the referee's opinion, it is. And he gave the free kick, indirect, of course, just about on the penalty spot. And somebody's going to get booked. Looks as though it... it Fairclough and Hodge are the two players talking to the referee. Looks as though Hodge's name has gone in. 
yellow card. Barton, oh, good save by the goalkeeper's feet. And the return shot deflected across the goal and cleared. It was Holds had the second effort, but Leeds scrambled it away. Paul Hart in the middle there next to Mervyn Day, who you may remember playing centre half for a few clubs, Leeds United being one of them. Flags up on the far side. And this time it's in Leeds' favour. McAllister takes, there's Chapman. Cantona, Segers only half away. This is Hodge. Oh, good ball, McAllister. Right across. Ooh. But it's got to be a corner because his cross was deflected by a Wimbledon head away from Segers and the goalpost. <laughs> That's Fairclough, offside, offside. Hodge turned the ball in the net, it will not stand. He may have been, not been the only Leeds player that far forward when we see it again. But there was somebody in an offside position and well spotted by the linesman on the far side. There's the header. There are two of them in there, in fact, if not more. Cantona is one and Chapman. Chris White. Chapman. Good header on. Wallace. <laughs> Set up by Lee Chapman. And that's a good combination up front for Leeds because little Rod Wallace is a, is a whippet. He gets away so fast. And that shot rising just over the bar. Chapman. Ah, offside. by Warren Barton for Wimbledon would you believe that they do come up with the unexpected don't they and the bench I think are as surprised as anybody well I did say earlier that Barton counts a goal he scored at Anfield as a very precious one he's now got one at Ellen Road against the champions and just look what happened a superb lob and Lukic is nowhere it's over his head and in <laughs> And Wimbledon make it 1-1 with 14 minutes to go. To Rigo. Now they've got some runners on here of Leeds. Barton's got to be sure what he's doing here. He couldn't pass back. Wallace. Oh, it all worked well for Wimbledon, didn't it? Wallace did it for him. That is really where the defender is in a nightmare situation because... He doesn't want to give the ball to his goalkeeper, but he's got forwards breathing down his neck. Dorigo. Hodge. Cantona. Can he edge it on to Chapman? He can, Chapman! A massive celebration starts around Ellen Road. Mixed, I would say, with a certain amount of relief. Leeds haven't played as well in the second half, but Chapman, who put them ahead when they were playing well, has now restored the lead. Segers beaten by a fulsome shot with just four minutes to go. Steve Hodge plays a part in the build-up here, slides the ball in. Cantona, two defenders get half a touch on it, headed on by Cantona, Chapman... Oh, Sega's got his hands to it, but it went inside the near post because of the sheer power of the shot. Cantona, Wallace, 
Barton. Back in by Chapman. Cantona, this is going to come to Hodge, is it? It's Earl with him. Segers has missed it. Cantona! No! How did that stay out? Oh, and the goalkeeper, what is he doing there? Hodge. <laughs> I don't quite know where Hans Segers was going, but uh, they've kept the ball out the net somehow. <laughs> Goodness, that was a scramble. Dorigo. The champions start with three points after being given a scare in the second half. Lee Chapman continues his run of scoring form against this opposition, getting both goals today. But Wimbledon, who do love to thumb their noses, figuratively speaking, at the big guns, threaten to do so again until Howard Wilkinson's team wipe the smile off their face just four minutes from the end through Lee Chapman. Well, Lee, I think Wimbledon are uh, getting sick of the sight of you. That's seven goals against them in five games. Yes, I've got a good scoring record against them in the last few seasons. Um... But saying that, it was a difficult match again. Wimbledon played typically Wimbledon. Um, they, they grind you down, they keep on going for 90 minutes, and uh, you've got to keep going against them. You have to motivate yourself, because it's sometimes not the prettiest of football. Now, everybody today was watching the uh, new law as applied to the pass to the goalkeeper. Did you think there was an element of indecision on the part of the Wimbledon defender when you scored your first goal, Roger Josie? Yes, I've got to say, I, I could see, see him actually thinking, oops, I can't, I can't pass back here. And for a split second, he pondered on the ball and allowed me to nip in. Um, it's going to take a while for people to get used to this in the first few games. I'm sure there's going to be many more mistakes. Puts real pressure on defenders, you think? It does put pressure on, on defenders, and uh, at times it, it promotes unskillful play. Um, but I'm sure in, in time, defenders might get round it. But uh, I must say, I'm not an advocate of, of the law at the moment. It's already caused confusion, hasn't it, Alan? I mean, but you can head the ball back, you can chest it back. But you can't pass it back. Well, you can pass it back, but the goal here, you can't pick it up. Yeah, right. And there were quite a few examples in that match of, of it causing trouble, and you've got them for us. That's right. The first incident happens early on. It's Batty mm -hmm. wide on the right-hand side. And really, it's a nothing ball in the middle. And last season, Fitzgerald just puts his foot in the ball, and the goalkeeper picks it up. But of course, this season, you can't pass it back. He panics, and he just blasts it anywhere into touch. The second incident is really just a long punt from Sanchez. Punts it forward, Holdsworth onto it quick. Fairclough does particularly well to get back, but I think he forgets about the rule here. Passes it back to Lukic, and this could go absolutely anywhere. And they were lucky to get away with that. Again, this incident, just another long punt up the pitch. Chris White runs back. He passes it back to Lukic, and this is great play from Big John here. A perfect chip, first time to Dorigo. I would have been proud of that myself, I must admit. <laughs> Whether he would have done it mid-January when it was muddy, it was open to debate. This is the goal here. McAllister hits it in, it goes through the pack, and Joseph, he's indecisive, he can't pass it back. First touch is terrible. Chapman does well, and he ends up in the back of the net. But the point about all these incidents is that the pitch there is perfect. Like I say, when it comes to mid-January and you've got a muddy pitch, you're going to have all sorts of fun and games. It's going to produce a, an awful lot of excitement for the fans, isn't it? But the actual rule was brought in to, to stop delays in the play, to speed the play up. But it's actually now it's going to create confusion, isn't it, Gary? Well, it is. And I think, especially in the first few weeks, I think they'll adapt in the end. The defenders will adapt. But I think what we'll see is the ball hoofed into the stand quite frequently. And whether we really want to see that, I don't know. Um, as a striker, I think there'll be more chances around. I would be thinking now, well, I might get a few goals early in the season, as Lee Chapman pointed out there. But the thing that worries me is what you saw there, Wimbledon doing, hitting the ball behind the defenders, forcing defenders to run back towards their own goal, and what do they do? And I just think, personally, that it just encourages the long ball game even more. Mm -hmm. OK. Now, there are one or two examples you want to show us there for, of Leeds attacking play. Yeah, Leeds are very strong going forward, and I particularly like the way they use Chapman's height this is a long throw from Dorigo. Chapman flicks it on, he's hard to pick up, and reacts quickly to the header out. 
It's a great shot that goes just wide of the post. And as I say, they've got so many men that can break forward from the middle of the park. They are quite formidable at home when they're playing well. This time, the Rigo, great ball, speed breaks from the middle of the park. Again, they use Chapman's height well at the back post, and really, I think he'll be disappointed with that. Mm -hmm. Chapman today could have three or four goals quite easily. He's been a much underrated player, Gary, over the years, hasn't he? He's always been a goal scorer. I mean, he's not the most mobile of players, he knows that, but he's intelligent. And he knows what position to get into to give himself goal-scoring opportunities. And he could have had four or five goals today. OK. Now, last season, Sheffield United had their usual awful start to the season, but ended up playing like champions. Manchester United began like champions and finished with just seven wins in their last 21 games, letting Leeds in for the title. Well, today at Bramall Lane, Sheffield United against Manchester United. Who would start well this time? A commentary from Barry Davis. Now stands the clock at five to three. And once more, there's football here to see. And at Bramall Lane, in the Sheffield United lineup, just one new face, Alan McCleary. He's on loan from Millwall and replaces the suspended Brian Gale. More significant, though, is the face still here. Brian Dean, whom supporters expected to see depart, and who has just signed a new two-year contract. Manchester United leave their million pounds by Dion Dublin from Cambridge United on the bench and include Darren Ferguson, the manager's son, in midfield. Presumably, Neil Webb will soon be seen in new colours. The referee is Brian Hill from Kettering, wearing the new referee's green strip. It's all been a touch confusing at Bramall Lane this week because in midweek there was a celebration of Christmas. That's because in the last couple of seasons Sheffield United hadn't really started playing until the new year. Last season moving up to ninth place at the end, finding close to championship form when their opponents today couldn't quite find their championship form. Peter Schmeichel now justifiably to be called number one in Europe. Goalkeeper to goalkeeper. Paul Ince with a challenge and he came off worse. Hardly an aesthetic start to the season. Up he goes, challenges the goalkeeper, two feet off the ground. Free kick. Pain for Ince. It's Michael Phelan, one of two substitutes for Manchester United only. They have not got a reserve goalkeeper because of an under-16 tournament and an under-19 tournament and an injury to Gary Walsh. Chase for Konchelskis. Simon Tracy will be pretty adept at that. He likes to dribble the ball out. Pallister covering at the other end. Well, certainly end-to-end -end stuff. The ball hasn't seen too much of the midfield so far. The six-yard area, no marking on Dean. And Sheffield United had the start they were looking for. First test for McCleary. And he loses out to Hughes, who had a chance for the shot and delayed. And here's McClare. The better opportunity was there for Hughes, in my opinion. The goalkeeper was quite a long way off his line. And McClare following up, couldn't keep the ball down. And the substitution made, on comes Mike Phelan. In place of the unhappy Paul Ince. by Cork, they're winning a lot in the air, Sheffield United, both Dean and Cork. Two very experienced nodders. Kinchelskis. Phelan.
last meeting between these two sides here at Bramwell Lane. Sheffield United scored first. Dean was the scorer. Manchester United came back to win 2-1. David Barnes. Not again from Court. Switch to this side was an idea, but not accurate. Phelan. Ferguson, taken by McClare. And Chelsea's to his right. Switch could find Hughes in the inside left position. Ferguson now square, number five. Giggs makes the early run, tries to get in behind the defence and succeeds. And the challenge wasn't a good one. And McClare across the face. And one or two Manchester United players not unreasonably asking about that challenge by the goalkeeper on gigs must say it looked a bit suspect to me but he got away with it Simon Tracy taken by Gannon well struck free kick that's another corner He's moved a bit further across this time. Lynn Hodges to take the set piece once more. Brought up a man on the near post to his lake. And at the back is Cork. Kicked away by Blackmore. But uh, a foul by Cork when he won the ball. And it's clear the crowd have the right spirit getting behind Dave Bassett's idea. Owen. And Chelsea's to the right. McClare down the middle. Phelan starts to make a run down the middle as McClare moved off to the right. Here he is. I don't know what they were appealing for. Certainly was never an offside. Kanchelskis. Committing people but not finding the pass he wanted. to go into the crowd but his layoff wasn't as required McLean Phelan spare man on the right Irwin not the best of passes it made him hit it early Giggs no goal foul had already been committed And he just sort of swung an up and under, almost under the crossbar. Irwin there drove it across. It wasn't a very good cross, really, because it missed the far man. That came off the outside of the boot, and the goalkeeper was hit first by Konchelskis. Curious enough, I'm not sure that had Konchelskis not touched him, that might well have beaten Tracy. He was in uh, some trouble to claim it. It's going off the post. Goodness me. <laughs> and Peter Schmeichel, I don't know what language he's shouting in. Nodded on. And the header back by Pallister. And so nearly. Owen. 
Whelan. Hustled by Hodges. Free kick was given and quickly taken. John Gannon. Good turn. And a mistake by Bruce. This is Alan Cork. And the referee says penalty. It was an untidy challenge on Cork. Who didn't look as though he was going to make it all the way. Manister can't quite believe the award. Mistake there by Bruce. And the challenge brings the award or the penalty. Dean scores with Consumides. And he scored in the fifth minute of either half. Schmeichel the wrong way. And Brian Dean, about whom Dave Bassett has had to field so many inquiries, as many from supporters as from other clubs, has made a marvellous start after signing a new two-year contract. Here's Kanchelskis, that's a good claim. It's a lovely start for one of the game's great enthusiasts, Harry Bassett, or Dave, to give him his true name. Hughes. Kanchelskis unsure whether to go forward or come wide. Comes wide, and it's come to be found. Takes on three, useful cross if Giggs can get there, but it just curls away. Giggs once more. But that's a poor cross of the answer. Just a little nudge by Giggs on Gage. Free kick. winning out twice John Gannon it's well done by Carl Bradshaw in the long clearance and McCleary in trouble and Hughes scores certainly is route one with a vengeance and not by Sheffield United but by Manchester United the long long clearance from Peter Schmeichel and McCleary in trouble trying to get the ball in the air and Hughes gets the left foot on it and it's 2-1 it's back as a contest Ian Dublin, 23 years old, scored 18 goals last season, one of them, in fact, against Manchester United in a League Cup defeat. Ferguson, Phelan, Irwin. Ferguson, the youngster, calling for it. Hughes. 
Giggs. Better control now for Manchester United. Hughes. was the man who it was suspected would lose his place to Dion Dublin. And he started. And Dublin is now his partner. Come on, guys. Dublin. That's a foul by court. What a silly challenge. Goodness me, a player of his experience. Five in a line with the far post. Giggs on the near. Bruce beaten by Cork, but here's Dublin. Good stop. <laughs> Struck it well, and Tracy had to be lively to get down. It's Cork who headed away initially. Only two Dublin. Didn't waste much time, neither did Tracy. The home crowd at Bramall Lane celebrate a winning start. Courtesy of two goals by Brian Dean. Fifth minute of the first half and a penalty at the end of the fifth minute of the second. Mark Hughes putting Manchester United back in contention. But they really found what style they found a little too late. So Alec Ferguson's team open with the defeat. Dave Bassett's with a victory. 2-1. Would Manchester United have a bit of a complaint there about a penalty decision or indecision? I would have thought so. Mm. It was a stonewall penalty, there's no doubt about it. Ferguson plays a good ball through here. Giggs runs across. And Tracy surprisingly comes out with his feet. And he definitely plays it past them. There's no doubt about it. In actual fact, if the referee had a given a penalty, then there's every chance that he would have had to have sent Tracy off because it really was a bad challenge. There's no doubt about that. The only thing you could say was maybe he was unsighted, but it was definitely a penalty. All right. Well, they didn't get it and they didn't win. It was a good start uh, for Sheffield United and Dean in particular. Now, when uh, the England manager comes to pick his squad for mm. forthcoming matches, would you think he'd be in it, Dean? He's got a I good think chance. he's got every chance. Graham was actually at the game today. Mm. And um, if rumours are true that we're going... Um, a bit more direct, more long ball style, then he could certainly be the man. He's big, he's strong, he's a real handful, and he scores goals. Okay. You're a moderate second division outfit. Along comes Fairy Godfather, who spends 10 million and can conjure up plenty more. And you're a Premier League team, who the country's most expensive player chooses to sign for, your Blackburn Rovers. Alan Shearer wore the number nine shirt today, and Crystal Palace were captained by Jeff Thomas, their number eight, who we're told is about to be Blackburn's latest signing. First, though, he was trying to beat them. Tony Gubber was at Selhurst Park. Palace leaving their keeper, Nigel Martin, to take that kick just outside his area. That came off the defender. That'll be a throw to Palace, which Salako will take back after injury. Missed most of last season, as did the fullback here, Shaw. Looking for Mark Bright. <laughs> the merest glance on that header from Mark Bright and Palace's top scorer last season with 21 goals has taken just 37 minutes to open his account Palace have pumped so many of those high balls into the Blackburn area something just had to come eventually from one of them and the ball did appear to take a very awkward bounce right in front of Bobby Mims which must have made it especially difficult And the defender can hoof this one upfield where Shearer will chase, having come out of the middle, swap positions temporarily with Mike Newell. A cross for Newell a little long, but he can turn and look up, and Ripley's free! 1 1. <laughs> Stuart Ripley scores on his debut, having been signed from Middlesbrough in the summer for £1.3 million. A perfect response from Blackburn with three minutes to go to half-time. 
and Ripley had dropped off Eric Young and no other defender had picked him up and you might also question Nigel Martin's positioning because he does look to be well to one side of his goal oh, Palace benefit from the rebound there this is Solako pursued by Price and he's got free well, that'll be a corner but Salako has proved to be a real handful to Blackburn. And it looks like Chris Coleman will take this corner. And again, the penalty area. <laughs> and Gareth Southgate, his first goal for Palace. He's buried under an avalanche of teammates. Mims came a long way, but he only palmed it out just clear of the area, and Southgate steadied himself before hitting it back perfectly into that top corner. It was too much to pay, and that's what they've missed. He looks up, picks his spot, and Martin is beaten. Well, this is well into stoppage time now, almost three minutes on our clock. But Roger Milford allows the kick to be taken, and Palace has stolen an equaliser. It's the substitute, Simon Osborne, 20 years of age, three minutes into stoppage time. And seen from that angle, what a good goal it was from one of the smallest players in a crowded box. And he's made it three all. What a dramatic finish. Well, I never put that price tag on my head. I could only go out and play to the best ability that um, Alan Shearer can play. Um, if people want to pay that um, amount of money for me, then so be it. But um, I don't get involved in that. But I understand that the press are going to get at me um, this, this season. And um, hopefully they might give me a little bit of praise as well. But more praise than uh, to get on to me, really. But um, I'll just go out and play my normal game and hopefully get a couple more goals like this. Do you feel that goals like that just lift that weight of responsibility a little bit? Yeah, they do. They help you. Of course they help you. But... Um, there's, there's going to be chances when I miss them this season and um, hopefully I put more in than I miss. Crystal Palace haven't come to me and said Blackburn have um, agreed a fee, you know. So um, I've just got to wait and see if they come up with the money and then Crystal Palace will come and say, go and have talks with Blackburn. But you're saying you've not had talks with them so far? I've not had talks whatsoever so far. And you've not asked for a transfer? No. Must have been a difficult match for you today. <laughs> it was very difficult, but I mean, uh, I've got it under my belt now and uh, look forward to Tuesday now. Blackburn play on Tuesday as well, so we'll wait and see. But that was a dream start for Shearer, wasn't it? Oh, it's fantastic. The only problem is he's set his standards so high now that we're expecting that every week at Blackburn. But um, no, it's, it's the perfect way to start, especially when you're under the pressure with the fee that's been put on his head. And um, two great goals. Yeah, let's have a look at them. And let's have a look at the second one anyway. Yeah, well, this is the one he's done in Sweden during the summer. He, he hammers everything. I mean, he might not score the classic goals that strikers score inside the box. A lot of his goals will be real, real power shooting. Our man Albert tells us he scored on every debut he's ever made, all his England games at various yeah. levels and Southampton, Southampton reserves, etc. So he yeah. starts well. He's got a good record. That second goal was a bit reminiscent of Dalglish at his best, coming inside and bend it into the, the far corner. He runs a bit quicker than Kenny, didn't he? He's prime, mind you. But <laughs> I he don't think you should burden him with Kenny. <laughs> no, no, if he has a career like Kenny, he'll be doing very well indeed. Now, highlights of the other Premier League games played today, starting with the favourites for the title, Arsenal. Ray Stubbs reports. Tyburn's free kick was headed in by Steve Bold just before the half-hour mark. And a second goal was to follow for Arsenal soon after. It was a characteristic charge down up. The first to congratulate Fox was Robbins, who'd been told by Norwich manager Ian Walker at half-time he'd bring him on to get a couple of goals. Yeah. It's just one of those things, I mean, if you get the service into the box, you just try your best to hit the target, and uh, fortunately enough, uh, it's come off today, and uh, I mean, the pressure's on me now, really, isn't it? So uh, I've got to keep that up, and uh, hopefully the lads will keep winning.
At Stamford Bridge, there was a debut goal for Mick Harford. Chelsea, in their famous blue, had missed several chances before Harford let fly with only six minutes remaining. The celebrations were short-lived, though. 60 seconds later, Oldham were level. Chelsea goalkeeper Dave Besant's clearance went straight to Nick Henry, who only yards inside the Chelsea half, played it back first time straight into the goal. Harford's strike, resulting in only one point for Chelsea. It should have been three. Alert, Dave Besant, he's in, uh, he's in a bad way now. He's, he's very disappointed with himself, but you know he's a top-class goalkeeper and he'll, he'll pick himself up. It was a bad, bad way to give a goal away. Uh, but I, I thought we dominated the game. Uh, from start to finish and, and we could have come out clean cut winners but it's the first game of the season there's a lot of new players in the team and it'll, uh, it'll take a few games to uh, to blend us together as they say Coventry didn't waste any time at Highfield Road former postman John Williams provided a first class finish after only 8 minutes another debut goal 6 minutes into the second half Coventry were 2 up Middlesbrough goalkeeper Steve Purse took his eye off Terry Fleming's cross. David Smith scored from close range. Wasn't playing sailing for Coventry, though. Paul Wilkinson demonstrated again he can score goals at any level. He made it 2-1 with over 25 minutes to go. And Middlesbrough were talking about a disallowed goal for offside at the end of 90 minutes. Fidel and in light blue, Spurs were grateful to Paul Allen and Ian Walker for last-minute heroics. Allen's goal-line clearance prevented Kerry Dixon from scoring a debut goal for Southampton. Walker brilliantly saved the follow-up volley from Steve Wood. It finished 0-0. Ipswich looked like starting off with a win when Gavin Johnson needed only one touch to control and another to score after only half an hour. But six minutes from time, it all went horribly wrong for Ipswich. Phil Whelan's clearance went straight to Sir Regis. He crossed for Dalian Atkinson to make it a score draw at one all at Portman Road. I can't believe Arsenal two up and losing, can you? Used to be their strength, wasn't it? When they won the championship two seasons ago, they only let in 18 goals. Four goals in the first game. The defence has gone a bit, haven't they? That boy Mark Robbins, though, he's got that sort of goal touch, hasn't he? Yeah, I wonder if Alex Ferguson's looking at that tonight and thinking perhaps I should have given him a run of games because he's always scored goals for them when he's, he's come in. And, and you look at United and you think perhaps the one thing they really lack is a really consistent goal scorer. So mm. maybe he'll have his second thoughts, but he certainly took them well. I don't suppose your opinions would be coloured by what's happened today, because there are other matches this week as well. A but I mean, <laughs> a little bit, for, yeah, for Arsenal. But, but uh, you know, if you had to pick two sides, that either of which would win the championship, who would you go for at this stage? I'd well, pick four. Yeah. Go on. I then. think it's wide open. Do you? But only because I don't think there's an outstanding team there. I think I'll have to, have to go along with the rest of the pundits that would say Liverpool, Leeds, Manchester United, and Arsenal. But I can't have any sort of case for any of them. And I think it is wide open. Gary? I would go along with that to a large degree, but um, I've tipped United to do it at last this year, and um, just because they've lost the first game, I'm not going to change my mind. No Tottenham in the selections there. I, I think Tottenham are in a transitional stage, and I think that um, Terry and Dougie and Ray down there will be quite happy if they have a steady season and a good cup run. They've got a lot of new players in there that will take time to settle down, and he's bought for the future, really. I'll have to tip Liverpool, of course. Of course you will, of course you will. What a surprise. <laughs> now, one of the most imaginative and new signings in the close season was Chris Waddle moving back to English football f uh, with Sheffield Wednesday. Wednesday, who finished third last season, were away to Everton today. Our new signing, Clive Tilsley, fee by instalments and washes his own shirts, now reports. It's three years since Chris Waddle has enjoyed the banter of an English club dressing room. Three years in which he's furthered his reputation as one of European football's most precious gems a born crowd pleaser. People always love a skillful player and that's definitely what he is. I mean, he, he creates so many good things for teams and uh, it'll be a joy to watch, no doubt. Nine years have passed since Beardsley and Waddle brought joy to their native Newcastle. There's been talk of both returning, but as Peter proved with Everton last season, both belong in the big league. When he left Liverpool and, um, and he's come down, he, you know, he, people might have thought, well, he's down and see how he reacts to that, but as usual, he's a good professional he is. He's, you know, he's, he responded fantastic and he's, you know, the last season he was probably player of the season without doubt for Everton and no doubt they'll be looking for him this year to start a revival. For the 38 minutes he was on the field today, Waddle's influence was the greater. 
He teed up a great early chance for Carlton Palmer. Andy Hinchcliffe made the goal line clearance. Waddle's follow-up whistle clean through the goal mouth confusion. But it only needed a touch. Wednesday needed only 15 minutes to go into the lead, though. Neville Southall looking a little ring rusty. Manner from heaven for Nigel Pearson, who volleyed the visitors gratefully into the lead. But that was as good as the day got for Chris Waddle. Seven minutes before the break, the happy homecoming came to a sad end. Waddle suffered strained knee ligaments that will put his Premier League career on ice for several weeks. Number seven's time was up for now. Everton took their cue to take charge of the game, and it was Beardsley who provided the spark that lit the fuse for an equaliser on the stroke of half-time. Roland Nielsen's header fought in conveniently for Barry Horn to mark his Everton debut with a corker off the crossbar. 24 hours after Everton had invested half a million pounds in a specialist goal scorer, Paul Rideout, it was their other summer signing who provided the payout. The second half belonged to Everton in all but goals. Beardsley had the best chance to provide a winner, but although he waltzed his way towards a glorious opening, he couldn't quite walk the ball through it. Rideout preferred to Morris Johnson in Howard Kendall's starting lineup, almost capped a willing display with a headline goal. But Chris Woods got it right at the second attempt, and Wednesday got a point. But at what cost? Without Waddle, crocked by the greasy surface, they just weren't the same today. Trevor Francis needs him back sooner rather than later. Well, I don't think it's been a bad start to the Premier League, uh, do you? 27 goals, some good goals amongst them too. Uh, which one did you go for as the best? Some great strikes, but I'd have to go for the sheer goal. When he picked up, he's got nothing on, he's got very little support. He takes inside and finishes off with a super hit. Gary? I would agree with that. I think just because he got two that were special. Um, I thought uh, Mick Harper's was a great goal. Barry Horn took his well and Lee Chapman. But um, that was a Share really number one. one. Okay, yeah. we'll leave you with that one and we'll see you next Saturday. Good night.